Pop Health Podcast is a public service of 24 hour home care. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Pop Health Podcast. We start off 2021 having leaders come in to talk about the outlook of 2021 and beyond for the healthcare industry. Today's guest, Supercare CEO John Kassar, talks about the history of his organization, how respiratory care has blossomed, especially with the pandemic and on other matters like Medicare's competitive bidding and how competitive bidding might sound like a good thing for patient care, but ultimately patients suffered from receiving services because of it. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. You can check out other episodes of Pop Up Podcast by looking at us on YouTube, visiting our website, popupodcast.com, or finding us on Apple Music, Spotify, Stitcher, and all the other podcast channels out there. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the show. All right. Well, John, thanks so much for joining the show this morning. Thanks for having me, Gavin. How are you doing? Doing well this morning. Thanks so much. And uh, good to see you again. It's probably been, it's been a while since I've actually seen you. Yep. Uh, um, so, John, we like to kick off the show maybe away from healthcare, but maybe just a little bit about you. And so can you share with us something outside of healthcare, outside of the workplace that might surprise the audience? Uh, yeah, I don't know about absolute surprise, Gavin, but I think, uh, well, listen, outside of my basic activities of tennis, uh, walking with audiobooks. I think I walk with my uh, my watch, my iPhone watch, and uh, now for probably about five to seven miles, and I'm on audiobooks quite a bit now. Oh, nice. um, and I uh, do a lot of snow skiing and those type of things. But well, listen, I'm married with two teenage daughters, 16 and 18 years old. And, uh, you know, as, as many of us know right now, it's, uh, it's just a difficult time. And um, Zoom educational sessions are you know, for with most most mornings, it's 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 tough, right? They they don't seem to be busy enough, and homework doesn't to be doesn't seem to be excessive like it used to be in those days, right? And and, and uh, uh, pre COVID crisis, right? So, um, you know, they they've had delayed in sports, um, they've had time on their hands, um, you know. So ultimately, they reached out to their grandparents many times and didn't find a connection between the you know, you know, with the kids these days. So they use really some. You know, adults are more mostly used to basic forms of communication, like yeah. you know, a cell phone, imagine, or a, an actual regular phone. Um, and as many of our, us know, our teens don't seem to prefer communicating through texting. They only prefer communicating through texting, right? Yeah. Texting, yeah. FaceTime, and so on. So, you know, we got together and we realized we needed to create a better connection between teenagers and grandparents. Really, that's really what it came down to. So, you know, we created a goal is to reduce loneliness. Uh, reduce loneliness and enhance the learning between both generations. Um, so we created uh, Teens for Care. The kids kicked it off, and uh, they created a nonprofit foundation um, called TeensforCare.org. Um, that's going to be there to support many seniors uh, with technology. You know, with using their iPhones to enjoying music to you know um, how to use an Amazon Echo. I mean, it's incredible. Even my parents, um, my dad's a you know, 89 right now, and my mom is 78. I mean, they asked me, like, how do we use Amazon and Echo? And this thing has been read forever now, right? Yeah. Um, and I said, Mom and Dad, would you just turn the thing off, unplug it, and plug it back in? It'll reset. Yeah. Sure enough, they were out without music for two months. They did that, and they got to have music again. Some of the most basic things that I think all of us can do to help out the elderly and, and as in their home and their uh, social distancing, right? So, it's also really, in my opinion, it's a great way to give back for the teenagers to give back service hours. Yeah. Um, and, you know, really want better understanding and, and caring for seniors. So, super, they, you know, I, I, I uh, sort of kicked it off for them. And then after that, they, they took the lead and super proud of them and what they've created so far. And I'm really excited to see watch them grow and, you know, create something incredible. And hopefully chapters in, uh, uh, in uh, they're going to start with chapters in Long Beach. And then hopefully grow from chapters in Long Beach and Los Angeles and expand to uh, California and who knows where it goes. So uh, wow. opportunity is significant. And um, I think we all see that uh, even, even before this crisis that happened, I think that we all need to find a way to reach out to uh, really just, uh, you know, it's not about social distancing, distancing, they say. It's about, you know, uh, physical distancing to create yeah. better connections. So I think ultimately, I think that's really what we're trying to do. And I think. Um, I think teenagers can uh, have an impact on on that. I think we're trying to create that. So it's I don't know. It's also something for me personally that I'm creating, and and uh, I don't know when this podcast is going to come out. But uh, when it does come out, I think uh, things will be in full swing for for teensforcare.org, and I'm excited to 
to, to be part of it and support it uh, with my little with my kids and between my kids and my family and and uh, and uh, running Supercare Health, I think I'm I think I'm good for quite a while. Yeah, absolutely. So is teamsforcare.org up and running now as we record? It is. It is. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it is. And, and I think uh, we're, you know, we have at Supercare Health, we have thousands and thousands of seniors, both Medicare, managed care and so on. And, you know, uh, we're working with uh, Long Beach Meals on Wheels out here in, in uh, Long Beach to, to kick it off. And I mean, we just see so many opportunities and just creating that connection to the home and and uh, it's going to be exciting. It really is uh, seeing amazing partnerships starting to pop up between all the technology companies. And, and quite frankly, I think the teens, need their, the teens need to give back. They need to learn how to give back. They're very, very self-absorbed in a way, too. And yeah. uh, I think it's great for them to connect with this generation to, to be uh, better people. And I think that they can learn from the elderly. And I think the elderly can learn from them. So I think it's a win-win thing. So super excited about it. Awesome, John. Well, hey, when this comes out, hopefully they'll see it or hear it. Yeah. Appreciate the nice plug uh, there. And both your daughters are, uh, are doing 16 it? and 18 years old, two daughters, uh, Olivia and Ella. And uh, yeah, they're, they're uh, both in uh, the public school system out here in Long Beach. And, and uh, they, they're, they're doing what they can without a lot of sports and things like that. <laughs> awesome. Awesome, John. Cool. So let's get to know you a little bit um, yeah. get into super care. So give us a little background. You mentioned today you're in Long Beach. Uh, and for yeah. listeners out there, uh, most of you may have heard of Long Beach. It's uh, south of Los Angeles. It's one of the, one of the larger cities in, uh, in California. And did, were you born and raised there, John? Or give us a little bit of your background. No, no, I wasn't. I actually was not born and raised. Uh, this year was a significant event for me. But, uh, but at this, uh, listen, I was born in Canada. Ah. And uh, I left at six months old with my family and I moved to Los Angeles, you know. I think my father ultimately got sick of digging up snow. And uh, he told me the story one time of like, you know, we spent several hours digging up uh, his car in the snow, you know, during a winter storm, only to find out it wasn't his car. You know? <laughs> so uh-huh. so uh, I think, yeah, so my, you know, my father is a pharmacist, you know, um, he, he studied in, in, in uh, Canada. He, he graduated from USC uh, out here in Los Angeles, um, opened up a pharmacy called Supercare RX. It sounds familiar, uh, and he slowly grew it with the support of my hardworking mother, uh, who is was the backbone of, uh, of of the family and and of the business. As uh, my father be- became more of an entrepreneur, um, and so you know he's, he he supported uh, you know that was all a big support. And you know I worked in the family business uh, for for many years um, as a pharmacy support tech um, in the family. Uh, you know it just it was uh, it was constant, right? It was. It was helping out in the business. It was helping out the shelves. It was helping out with the medications. It was talking to patients. And you did that as a very young age, right? So I graduated from Loyola Marymount uh, University and actually did a brief year studying in Paris, France. And mais oui, je peux le français, moi aussi, avec un accent, right? Got a, did a little bit of that um, and received a business degree. Okay. So, you know, after graduating, um, I dabbled in international real estate. Um, then purchased several assisted living facilities for the elderly. Okay. Um, that's called Golden Care Living. Um, the facilities still exist today. And uh, one's a memory care facility. One's a, uh, a regular assisted living facility, but very intensive care in both of those settings. So really just, uh, you know, grew up in that healthcare type of space and that type of business and always loved it. So, but ultimately, you know, I came back to the family business early in the 1990s and you know, I had many roles in, you know, pharmacy, operations, uh, sales, and, and so on, and continue to sort of grow the company. You know, and then as my, you know, parents reached a little bit of a retirement age, um, you know, I bought the majority shares of Supercare Health, and uh, that was over 10 years ago. And today, you know, I took over, I mean, I took over that time, CEO and president of Supercare Health. So that's pretty much where we're at uh, today and uh, at uh, my age. Wow, that's awesome! So, Supercare uh, over four. I, I think I recall seeing over forty-five years. When did it actually start as Supercare RX? I guess nineteen seventy-four. Wow, nineteen seventy-four. Yeah, that is awesome, John. Great story, and we'll get yeah. into we'll get into um, more of your successes and challenges here in a moment. But could you give the audience and um, just a reminder, John? Our audience is mostly healthcare professionals. Anything from 
you know, a brand new uh, nurse's aide all the way up to a, a executive at a health plan. So keep that in mind as we, uh, as you respond to this, but what is super care health and talk to us about respiratory care. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I listen. I, I I definitely want to do that, but if you don't mind, Gavin, can I just uh, do a quick shout out to my team? Of course, that's okay. Yes. Listen, I I mean, I think during this time, listen, I have over seven hundred team members, uh, many on the front lines, you know, uh, putting themselves at risk during this time at COVID, and you know, from our respiratory count executives, clinical respiratory therapists, uh, you know, pharmacists, technicians, warehouse staff, you know, they are doing an amazing, amazing job caring for patients today. Um, you know, and, uh, and they're doing it both in the home and also through telehealth. So, you know, also to thank all the support staff and intake and coordinators and billing staff, claims processes, administration, IT, amazing job. So done an incredible job keeping us all, all going. So, you know, just want to do that shout out to them. Just super proud of all of them and, and the entire, all, all the team members in the company that really just love the care that they provide the patients. So. Um, yeah, in regards to super care, <laughs> thanks for letting me do that. I just, I, I, I'm just super proud of everybody. Uh, awesome. Today, you know, super care health is an in-home post-acute care provider, uh, caring for those with chronic care diseases with an intense focus on respiratory-related diseases such as COPD, uh, respiratory failure, obstructive sleep apnea, and and ALS things like that. Uh, you know, a lot of those pa patients ALS that uh, ultimately they require a lot of respiratory related devices. So we've been accredited since 1991 and in business for over 45 years. Um, we have over 1 million patients managed uh, through our subcapitated lives, through all the health plans. We manage over 60,000 active patients monthly. Uh, that's literally touching those patients every single month, uh, managing their care in the home with all of our respiratory devices, their oxygen, their ventilation, their CPAP, the equipment, the supplies, and about a thousand new patients um, every day hit our system. Wow. Um, brand new patients, uh, which is uh, absolutely incredible. And these patients come in from all of our locations from California, Nevada, New Mexico, Texas, and so on. So uh, it continues to expand, but a large portion of those patients are coming in from California. So, you know, we also offer, you know, a lot of those patients, they travel quite a bit. So we also offer a, a national travel respiratory program. Um, so all of them, doesn't matter where they are in the Western US and any of our locations throughout all those states, uh, you know, we off, often support them in their portable care and their mobile respiratory. So really, really uh, happy about um, uh, what, what we've accomplished so far. But you know, listen, we've got four core programs to our company. Um, and I think many of the, you mentioned your, you mentioned that there's case managers on the call here and doctors and so on. And you know, the four core programs are respiratory, sleep, uh, super kids, which is pediatrics and, and managed care. So, okay. you know, for respiratory, you know, we service primarily COPD patients. That's, so imagine there's over 15 million people diagnosed right now with COPD and 14 million undiagnosed patients. And it's the fourth leading cause of death of COPD is. And it's a, you know, it's a disease state that's growing and it's really, ultimately, it's worth managing a value-based care environment. Okay. Uh, so we serve with, you know, I think, uh, I think, you know, many people ask, well, how you, how do you get paid as well? Yeah. So, so ultimately we, we get paid through Medicare, uh, fee-for-service managed care with ventilation, BiPAPs, CPAPs, um, oxygen therapy, nebulizers, and, and, and medications. Well, so we manage um, that entire COPD patient with their entire continuum of care, be it stage one COPD or all the way to stage four COPD. And uh, fun fact, uh, Supercare today is uh, the largest ventilator provider in all of California. Um, and that's all through uh, CMS data and through uh, uh, Medicare data. So I'm really, uh, really happy about the team managing thousands of patients on, on ventilators. So um, that's our respiratory program. Uh, other one is sleep, sleep therapy. So we manage over 40,000 patients monthly just with CPAP and uh, BiPAP therapy. Uh, that includes their supplies. We also coordinate um, uh, diagnostic studies and uh, through home sleep testing um, and also support the facility-based sleep labs as well as non-facility-based sleep labs. So that's a, that's a growing diagnosis, obstructive sleep apnea. And for pediatrics, we developed the Super Kids program. Uh, which manages those kiddo, like little kiddos 
uh, discharged from little children's hospitals, UC Davis, Chalk, CHLA, Memorial, and so on, a lot of those systems. Yeah. We spent a tremendous amount of time you know, with our licensed RTs, help, uh, you know, just helping the discharge process to make sure they're discharged safely because these, these kiddos are just, uh, you know, they're invasive vent uh, patients with trach, with enteral nutrition, a lot, a lot of care, you know. And then finally, the fourth program is like our managed care and ACOs. Okay. So we contract out with well over 150 managed care organizations throughout the Western U.S., and we help provide utilization management and subcapitate over a million of those lives directly into Supercare Health with um, over 13 healthcare entities. Um, you know, those healthcare entities include, you know, Optum, uh, Scan, Scripps down in San Diego, Sharp San Diego, Prime, Prime Healthcare, HMC, which has, you know, well over six hospitals uh, out here in California, just, just to name a few, you know. Yeah. So many of our health plans are partners are saved not only through, you know, super care taking on risk and managing those lives of home medical equipment utilization. Uh, but, you know, we also offer many of the Medicare Advantage, Medicaid and other plans care management solutions. Okay. So like uh, respiratory care management and things like that. So um, super proud. I mean, I think uh, I, you know, I looked at, uh, I listened to one of your uh, uh, podcasts quite a while ago and you said something important. I think that, you know, you said, I think it was uh, well, four or five months ago, I forgot which uh, person was, uh, was speaking, but you said, you know, that studies are important, but very few people have done them correctly. And very few people have uh, information on them. Well, Supercare Health spent two years developing an IRB approved FDA processed institutional review board study on COPD over two years. And we demonstrated an 82% reduction in readmissions so with 65% all-cause reduction in readmissions, that's just like a total savings of $2.3 million for every 1,000 patients managed. Wow. So that was just, uh, I, I can't tell you, that was super, I was super impressed with the final results of that study. And it took a lot of money, a lot of time, and, uh, but it was well worth it to finally get it developed uh, because okay. everyone can prove readmissions, right? But can you really prove it through a, a true control group is the question, right? <laughs> Yeah, no, that's great. I wanted to ask you, um, you know, I've been in, in healthcare for 20 years and yeah. I know what capitated means, but I haven't, yeah. I haven't heard the term subcapitated often. Uh, that's a good, that's a great question. Yeah. yeah so I think, um, look, I, I think we, in, in California, as well as, as it's growing throughout the Western, uh, you know, the U S and especially it's in Florida and Texas and Washington and New York and so on. You see, you know, a lot of the health plans are capitating directly to not just the medical groups, but they're also now capitating to hospitals, right? And so as those medical groups take on risk and as the hospitals take on risk, they're looking to, for someone to manage also all those lives and those dollars, if you will, right? right? So Supercare Health takes on, on managing as a subcapitated basis all the risk of all the lives of respiratory related diseases, patients on oxygen therapy, ventilation, CPAP, BiPAP supplies, um, everything from you know all medical supplies and even home medical equipment, wheelchairs, walkers, canes, and so on. So any imagine any patient being discharged out of a hospital um, that requires any of those services, um, super care on a subcapitated relationship with all of our health plans and hospitals, we're exclusive to those entities and we will take on that. We will manage those patients um, from the hospital discharged all the way to the home and manage them on an ongoing basis as they're in the home. So, okay. That makes sense. So let me walk through this for the audience that may not understand capitation or that's not your, your world. Yeah. So, John, cut me off if I'm, if I'm off here. So let's say Medicare gives the health plan a thousand dollars a month for a patient. That health plan might then give the hospital a hundred dollars, let's say, in yeah. case, uh, a month, and might give you like twenty dollars a month, regardless of what happens. So that, and That's you, would manage, you would manage any. Okay, cool. Yeah. So we manage that cost regardless of if the utilization goes up or down. I mean, it. You know, Supercare has to do our best to provide utilization management yep. um, to manage that patient's care. So, you know, what we've done is, you know, we provide, we, our, our entire utilization staff utilizes a lot of, you know, current in, in, uh, in processes and 
logic training, a little bit of AI embedded in there too in regards to medical necessity guidelines for oxygen and nebulizers and wheelchairs and all those products. And so we're, we're, our staff definitely is trained to make sure that all the documentation that's coming into our system is appropriate and medically justified. Um, and so while we manage all that DME utilization, we try to buttress it together with those value-added programs that we just discussed, which is like our iBreathe program with our IRB study, which has so much more significant value yeah. than that of just managing basic DME and utilization, things like that. Like, for example, we rolled out a home sleep testing uh, program for a lot of our managed care organizations, and now that's like 80% of uh, so there's 65 percent less the cost of facility based testing. Those type of programs are really valuable for um, case managers, doctors, health plans, and things like that. So, John, you mentioned you know 45 years family business, and as companies grow, percentage growth mm -hmm. is more difficult. So, for example, Google, if Google grows a billion dollars annually, that's tiny percentage growth, and they wouldn't win awards on percentage growth. Right, right. Supercare, which is already a well-established company, over the last three years has grown 100%, over 100%. Yep. I and think you might have got that from a statistic on Inc. 5000, didn't you? Yes, exactly. Unfortunately, yeah. unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately that's public knowledge. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. We grew 100% by in the past uh, three years. So tell me, what was the key, already being a pretty large established company, to be able to achieve 100% growth in three years? I mean, like um, everyone knows, and you know, success does not happen overnight. Uh, you know, we built a strong foundation of systems and ultimately of trust throughout the past 45 years. You know, and we continue to try to do better in improving our process of providing these services um, and ultimately to not squander this opportunity of disruption in the industry, right, with COVID-19. So our business growth has been both organically uh, grown as well as through strategic acquisitions. Okay. Such as we, we purchased uh, the Walgreens uh, uh, respiratory division uh, uh -huh. in California. We purchased Life Care's respiratory business um, out here in California as many have exited you know, the space. So you know, we continue to, to focus on the high-risk respiratory patient, which is um, you know, with COPD being, like I mentioned, 15 million lives in California, and excuse me, throughout the, the country and 14 million und undiagnosed. It's, a, it's just a large growth opportunity. Um, and we continue to focus on that high-risk respiratory patient. So, you know, as long as we continue to provide those positive outcomes for our physicians uh, and that, you know, with, that are satisfied and, and through a connected type of patient model and ultimately reduce the cost to our partner managed care companies, our partner managed care companies see the value, our partner physicians see the value as we provide this ongoing connectivity of our respiratory solutions directly from the home, directly into the physician's office. Um, and they see a lot of value in that, right? But, yeah. uh, you know, I have to say too, I mean, you know, competitive bidding has taken a huge toll in our industry. Um, and I think that with competitive bidding, I think that, you know, that's a significant challenge. And for most people with very, very tight margins, you have to work on, you have to be able to manage on those tight margins. And, you know, being a larger, a little bit of a mid-sized type of organization, we've been able to still grow through those margins, even though they continue to shrink over the past 10 years. Yeah. Uh, but competitive bidding as of recently has been eliminated. Um, the, uh, CMS just informed us uh, in 2020 here, at the end of 2020, that we are no, uh, CMS will no longer be expanding competitive bidding for the next three years. And they publicly stated that the reason for that is because they haven't found any savings. It's the first time in over 10 years that CMS has acknowledged that um, they have not uh, identified any savings through the new competitive bid process. And that just shows that, I mean, we, we officially sort of hit bottom as, as an industry from a margin standpoint. And I think uh, that's really also what allowed us to grow is through, uh, unfortunately, a lot of smaller um, HME companies could not continue to grow through this. Uh, yeah. We grew through it. We focused on a market that we felt that was had specialty, had clinical uh, implications, and we acquired strategic uh, companies that we felt that were appropriate to supercare in our current culture. So that definitely uh, that definitely has an, a global impact over our the collective components of 
competitive bidding and the disease state and, and respiratory growth collectively have a significant impact over, over that growth. So tell us, I think most of our audience may not know what competitive bidding uh, is and why that yeah. was, that's important for your industry. I mean, I can kind of guess like people yeah. are prepared to go with the lowest bid or, I mean, tell us what the change is and why it's good. Because I think a lot of our audience would be like, well, isn't competitive betting a good thing? So can you uh, walk yeah, competitive. Questions? Yeah. Un- unfortunately, listen, I mean, competitive bidding um, originally the way it started was um, any independent provider that had, let's say, three employees that working or out of their garage um, literally bid for the entire state of California um, and didn't even have the capacity to service the patients uh, or the infrastructure or what have you. And they had nothing to lose. So what they would do is they bid, for example, an oxygen concentrator that was at $150. They bid the oxygen concentrator at $65. Okay. And it, what happened, it brought down the entire industry yeah. over the past 10 years. Okay. And so what happened with those rates in managed care is managed care organizations adopted the same Medicare allowables as Medicare. Yeah. So it not only impacted all of Medicare, it also impacted all of our ma- med- managed care rates as the allowable continue to reduce. Um, devastating for the entire industry as a result, uh, very few survived in, the, in, in this industry. And, uh, and after three rounds of something like this, um, they realized there's no more independent providers, strong independent providers left. And um, when they rebid it out just recently in 2020 here, all the rates actually went up and didn't go down. And, and as, as, as a result, I think a, a medic, you know, CMS Medicare acquiesced and said, listen, we are going to cancel competitive bidding because we no longer saw the savings in, in the appropriate model. So how does this matter to, uh, let, let's talk to our audience here. So if someone lowballs a bid on respiratory care, let's just blank it as respiratory care. How does that impact patient care when you get that lowball bid and they can't deliver? Yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I, that's a great question. I mean, amazing question, Gavin. Thanks for going to the heart of the issue, right? I mean, you're going to the heart of it. It's patient care, right? You're, you're saying, ultimately, how do you even survive of providing services in the home at $70 to manage an oxygen patient? I mean, we're talking about sending out a respiratory therapist, doing an assessment, managing their supplies in the home, managing all their, their tanks, uh, buying the equipment, providing on-call services, managing after-hour care. Uh, it, it's almost, and, and that, that doesn't include the 20% copay the patient has to have. So we have to do all that under $55, and we still have to bill the services and so on. I mean, you can quickly see that um, the model uh, really is not sustainable and was not sustainable to provide all that level of clinical care in the home. And, 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 and even if you're providing a, a, a mobile device that requires a little bit less care, you're spending $1,600 on a mobile concentrator of which you re- obtain less than, for example, $70 per month. So you can quickly see that the models don't work. And we're here really to provide care to um, our hospital case managers and um, all the social workers that need to discharge these patients. And I think they want the option to, prov- have, to, ha- to provide a quality provider to yeah. get in the home, to deliver that care on time with a uh, STAT ETA under four hours on a hospital discharge so they don't get a re- uh, a, keep that patient back in the system. Yeah. All that process can't be done, be it an oxygen concentrator, a walker, a wheelchair, and so on. All those items are competitively bid. And it's difficult to manage that patient from a care management, case management standpoint um, under those uh, under those allowables. So you made it through competitive bidding. Yeah. Very few survive, but you, you, you pulled through. This reminds me of our current pandemic. So many people, you know, it's it's tough to survive. Different industries, um, there's, there's maybe fear, gloom, and doom. But as with any storm, the strong will survive. Um, and so I know talking off air with you, you guys have been able to strengthen during the pandemic. And I want to yeah. ask you a couple things. One is when the pandemic first hit, what type of fear or um, gloom and doom came to your company that you as a leader had to push through? Tell me about 
if any, if you had to do any of that? I mean, absolutely. I mean, listen, I, I received tons of phone calls from um, hospitals and health plans and so on asking me, for example, for ventilators. Um, that was the initial first uh, set, uh, part of the fear, right? Um, being Supercare is one of the largest ventilator providers, you know, we may have been the largest ventilator provider. We only have so many ventilators available and, and so on. So the first part of the fear was, is that, you know, do we even have enough product in place, you know, for, for our customers, our current customers that need our current products? Um, then the other part of the fear was, how do we send out respiratory therapists in the home with a lack of PPE, right? So now we have to send out respiratory therapists, patient care technicians, all in the home. We have to maximize the inventory levels. We have to maximize our PPE. We have to provide appropriate communication systems to our patients. I mean, listen, our patients are used to us going to the home, managing their care, providing the equipment, uh, providing the services in the hospital on the floors, of which now the hospitals are saying, you know, we can't allow anyone else on the floors anymore. So uh, it's a complete realignment in how we provide care. But uh, that was definitely an initial upfront panic. Um, and then it went from quickly from ventilation management to now what's continued to spike in regards to oxygen therapy. Now oxygen therapy is the new model of managing approach by patient and care, not as much ventilation management. So, you know, we deployed, um, obviously, you know, hundreds and hundreds of our uh, existing team members all into the home. Um, you know, they're all managing their care virtually like every other health plan and hospital system and so on is doing so. And we, you know, increased our telehealth and telecare by thousands of percent like everybody did. And fortunately, we were sort of uh, during this process of our IRB studies and our remote patient monitoring, we were a little bit ahead of the curve. So yeah. we were able to adapt really rapidly. And, um, uh, you know, as a matter of fact, we have, uh, we use Amazon as our, as our phone system and our core services. Yeah. And, um, uh, and Amazon itself was able to uh, allow us to deploy all of our phone systems through Amazon Connect and into the home very quickly and seamlessly. So um, all of that was, uh, happened very rapidly and, and the chaos was quick. Uh, we communicated every single day uh, through flash huddles. We com communicated through the internet to keep everybody up to date uh, through our internet. Yeah. Um, and we held um, both, you know, Zoom calls and, and so on where, where we're at today. I mean, but ultimately where we're at today is, is look, we try to alleviate the stress today, right? I mean, that's really what it's about. Today, we all need to just to calm down. Our employees need to feel safe and secure, right? And in order for us to do that, we want them to be in a fun environment. So we do fireside chats, um, maybe a little bit of cocktails so sometimes if it's after hours. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll do, uh, you know, everything from pumpkin carving events and Halloween events, and we'll do it virtually. And we, we, at this point, we try to keep it more a cohesive family environment that has an amazing fun culture. And, and we try to keep it light and let the employees know how to stay safe. And I think, uh, you know, just proud of the team members and the leaders that have worked with me that have really just allowed all that to happen right now where people feel comfortable where they work. They have a secure place uh, to work and uh, they're happy to be here and they're happy to make a difference. Awesome. So you mentioned the term flash huddles. So when I think of like team huddle, it's like your morning huddle, yeah. you know, your, your, after, your end of day huddle. I haven't heard the term flash huddle, but I'm guessing that's like a super quick like, yeah. Tell me what that means. Yeah. yeah, it's funny. I mean, you know, some people get used to call them daily huddles. Yeah. Um, we don't call them daily huddles. We call them flash. We want people to know that we want to get large teams together to collaborate um, and to communicate um, across all divisions. And we want to do, uh, we want to perform the call in under 15 minutes. That's okay. our goal. Um, okay. And at, everyone has to very quickly spit out exactly what they're talking about in under 15 minutes and under one minute each. Yep. And the top 15 leaders in the company will be able to, to collaborate. And that eliminates emails, eliminates chats. It communicates, you communicate better with your teams. You implement, you, you pretty much you get the barriers out of the way very rapidly and you improve communication. And really that's really what it's about in this environment, right? It's, it's about, you know, trying to communicate and communicate rapidly 
and make sure everyone has the same type of information. And it's not done in an email, in a silo, or in a chat, a small chat session, or what have you. And it's, I think it's more important to have that dialogue, um, audio dialogue, right? Yeah. <laughs> Instead of a chat or email, what have you, dialogue. And I think that really just creates the cohesiveness within a, a positive organization. Awesome. That's great. Uh, I might uh, steal that term in the future. Flash huddle. Cool. I recommend it for everybody. It makes a big difference. Definitely. That's something uh, on my day job we're trying to get better at is start on time, end on time. Right? Yes. Um, okay. So as we wrap up today's episode, John, obviously the, the COVID-19 pandemic um, has created more respiratory disease, uh, COVID being a respiratory issue. So you guys have grown. Yep. Obviously there's more uh, respiratory care in the future. Tell us briefly about respiratory care's future and super care's future. Yeah, sure. I mean, look, we're going to continue to grow with our respiratory service in the home. Uh, we'll enhance it with more, you know, innovative digital solutions that's truly going to integrate our devices in the home while improving patient experiences and the journey. Uh, we'll also see tighter partnerships uh, that with home health and a private duty care and, and so on. We're going to definitely quickly, quickly see those partnerships coalescing together, right? Um, we're going to see new distribution channels uh, moving forward that never existed before. I mean, you can quickly see the consumerization of healthcare and, and where that's going. And then what one entity that was providing healthcare is, uh, you know, you, you never imagine right now is actually providing healthcare, i.e. retail type of clinics and so on. So, I mean, listen, the future is bright and I feel confident that SuperCal is going to continue on being a leader and an innovator, you know, in providing respiratory care. Uh, you know, beyond the Western U.S. and on hopefully in the future. And as long as we stay nimble and agile and be creative. Uh, and uh, I think uh, things, are, things are really exciting. Awesome, John. And uh, lastly, let's end today's episode. Maybe if you can briefly share a story that stood out to you over the last six to nine months. Um, is yeah. there a patient story, staff story? Let's oh. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of stories out there, right, Gavin? I mean, it's incredible. I mean, we now, I mean, we we rolled out, we have over 900 uh, active COVID patients on our service right now on wow. oxygen therapy. Um, I mean, we partnered with um, um, Optimum rolling out the first, you know, remote patient monitoring COVID O2 type of patient uh, program. And we rolled it out with our apps and integrated it. So there's a lot of patients out there, a lot of stories. I mean, one story that comes to mind is, but it started up, it, it's nice to hear about a story pre-COVID okay. and see where it's at today a little bit too. Okay. Um, but I'll talk about this, this gentleman, Jose, for HIPAA purposes, I'm not going to mention his last name. I mean, you know, he, he was struggling with respiratory issues and related to COVID, increasing his shortness of breath. Uh, the inability to keep up as he had in the past, you know, it's difficult when you have shortness of breath and walking or tra you know, moving himself. Um, you know, Jose's physician, he's been, he was managing his symptoms through, um, you, know, you know, typical means such as like inhalers and steroids and so on. Uh, unfortunately, his disease continued to progress as COPD does do from, you know, we all, we talked about this before, stage one to stage four. Uh, to a point where it required nebulizer, you know, nebulizer medications and and oxygen therapy, and um, our pharmacy and services provided those type of services as well. You know, but despite these efforts, you know, Jose's symptoms persisted, and he was admitted back to the hospital with an exacerbation. Very, very common. That's why COPD is, you know, the fourth leading cause of death is those exacerbations and readmissions. And he was later diagnosed with uh, chronic respiratory failure. Um, you know, SuperCare's patient coordinators work with the case management staff to facilitate the discharge. Uh, we ensured we had proper tools successful to the post-discharge. Um, you know, we uh, ensured a safe transition from one of our licensed respiratory therapists that visit him in the home, conducted a comprehensive in-home respiratory assessment. That included, you know, uh, pulse oximetry, spirometry, medication, uh, medication management and inventory, you know. And then along with the comprehensive in-home clinical assessment, our RTs then uh, initiated non-invasive ventilation therapy, uh, you know, all for him. So the process included, you know, titrating the patient settings in the home per physician's instruction, providing an oxygen bleed in um, into the home, installing a modem, uh, which is brand new, by the way, that never existed before, even just a little bit over a year ago, 
Now we have a modem integrated directly with a ventilator. Mm -hmm. um, so now he can closely be monitored real time as to his services within the home and where his status is. So he and his caregiver also received the care hub today. So now we sub submit you know, electronic uh, emails of videos and texting and resources and reminders. And that also helped him out a little bit with his, uh, uh, his caregivers too, that needed to be also better educated about his care. Yeah. Uh, education provided to, to him and Jose was along with the, the support team, helped him gain control over his symptoms, provided a support system to his caregivers that really knew now the new medical devices and services that are needed. Um, and I think it really just ultimately reduced readmissions and it helped him spend less time thinking about breathing. I think that actually, that was, that was really what resonated with me personally is that prior to this, he really spent so much time thinking about how am I gonna breathe? Am I gonna have an exacerbation? Am I gonna have shortness of breath? Am I gonna be readmitted to the hospital? So um, he ultimately had the goal of, of wanting to go out and spend time with his grandchildren and we gave him the security of breathing and being able to breathe consistently and knowing what his symptoms were and the care that he's providing and the education provided to feel secure enough to get out. Just this is as of recently, he couldn't go to an event, but uh, as of three months ago, he got out, he spent time with his grandchildren walking side by side around the block and really just felt amazing that he was able to get out, breathe, and not feel that he was going to have uh, another uh, exacerbation and be readmitted to the hospital. But that took a lot of care in the home, a little bit of technology, phone care and coordination, telehealth, um, you know, uh, personal communication of his, his reimbursement uh, solutions. Um, it's a team effort. And I think to manage these patients, you know, it's not just all about technology and digital solutions. There's a lot of people behind it, um, and it really does make a difference in patients' lives. Yeah, man. One line you said there was uh, the security in being able to breathe. And I'm just like, yeah. I don't even think about that. You know, yeah. I've been in healthcare 20 years, and yes, I know, but just that, it's so simple, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's a great, it's, it's, it's a comp, what you guys are doing is complex, but in the end, what he wants is something so simple. And I, you, Gavin, I absolutely love that you said that. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, imagine trying to breathe through a straw yeah. and, and, and all of a sudden finding that straw tightening up on you. That's what a COPD patient feels. And we're here to open up the airways and make patients feel comfortable and secure that they understand what they can do to, to, to have a better life and, and, and a safer life in the home. Awesome, John. Well, hey, man, you've been a great guest today. Uh, how can folks? You. Learn more? You're welcome. How can folks learn more about Supercare? Well, I mean, just go to uh, SupercareHealth.com or Supercare.com. I mean, we're there. We're on. We're we're listed on the website, and you can reach out to me through LinkedIn too. And you know, uh, John Kassar and at Supercare Health. If you have any questions, and I mean, um, I'm I'm looking forward to, to to continue to contribute to the post acute care and to make a difference in patients' lives. And I mean, this is all a journey for all of us, isn't it? It's, it's amazing. To, it, I love the, what we do and I love making a difference. And we're, we're pretty fortunate, aren't we, Gavin? Sure are, John. Sure are. Right. Awesome. Well, hey, everybody. John, thanks again for being on the show today. Take it easy. Bye, everybody. One of the ways that Pop Health Podcast has thrived over the years is by you, the audience, leaving reviews for us, which helps create credibility for the show and visibility for the show as well, which ultimately leads to guests approaching us to be on the show or for us inviting guests and ultimately them accepting. I want to read a review today that was left by Josh Christ uh, just last month. And uh, Josh, thank you so much for the review. He labeled it empowering, insightful, and actionable. Whether you're well-established as someone who can translate creative energy into the impact you want to have on the world of population health, or just getting started as a catalyst for change, this is a must-listen podcast for you. Gavin and the entire Pop Health team do an incredible job leading conversations that cover a huge breadth of topics related to the ins and outs of building a thriving healthcare ecosystem with leaders who've actually walked the path. Highly recommend listening and subscribing. Josh, never met you before. Thank you so much. If you're listening to this episode, I really appreciate it. And I'd like to ask the rest of you, if you have it in your heart and enjoy the show, please take a moment to leave us a review. This review was left on uh, Apple Podcasts and there, Apple Podcasts or YouTube, 
Stitcher, those are our three kind of main areas where we, uh, we would love to have reviews. So again, thank you so much. Feel free to check us out and look forward to seeing your reviews. Thanks everyone for tuning in to another episode of Pop Health Podcast. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode. And if you have and want to check out other episodes, visit us at pophealthpodcast.com, iTunes or Apple Music, Spotify, Stitcher, and now YouTube as well. Take care.